Welcome to the chapter four relearning notes that will include going over your multiple choice test, helping you fix it, and learn the things that you need to know to uh, help you on the future tests. This video is broken into two parts. Part one are some relearning notes for which you'll need a periodic table, some notes paper, and a pen. And then part two of the video will be going over all the test problems. And for that, you'll need your test and a page to write down a bunch of fixes. So pause the video now and make sure that you've got a periodic table, some note paper, a pen or pencil, and then you've got your test available and some page to do some fixes on. Pause the video now, make sure you've got those things out. Okay, we're going to start with a little bit of review of chapter four. In these notes, the expectation is, is that you write them down on a piece of paper. You can have lines on it, but we're going to start up here and we're going to start with just the overview of some really important things from chapter four that you need to know to be successful on the test. Part one. You need to know what an electrolyte is. An electrolyte is something that conducts electricity, and there are two different types. There are strong electrolytes, and you need to know which ones those are, and there are weak or non-electrolytes. And you need to be able to classify between the two different types, strong or weak or non. And the classification isn't super tough, but once you start getting questions asked about different types of reactions, you've got to know these cold and then know that everything else fits over here. These will be good conductors of electricity. And the things that are good conductors of electricity contain lots of positive and negative ions. These are charged things that have either gained or lost electrons. They contain lots of positive and negative ions that have either gained or lost electrons. These guys contain few positive or negative charged things or none if they're a total non-electrolyte. The way to know the difference is to memorize a few of the strongs. And there are three different classifications of the strong electrolytes. First there are the strong acids. The strong acids always start with an H, as acids are generally defined as things that are H plus donors. H plus donors. This came from what's called the Bronsted Lowry definition of acids. They said that things that give up H pluses in reactions are known as acids. The strong acids to know are hyper, hickel, high. HONO, HNO3, HICLO, HClO3, and HClO4, and H2SO4, of which H2SO4 is known as a diprotic acid because it contains two, the prefix di means two, protons. H plus is also known as, AKA, a proton because a proton is simply a hydrogen atom that has lost an electron. And so when you hear that acids are proton donors, that simply means they're H plus giver awayers. These completely dissociate, divorce, break up, or ionize in solution to form the H plus and the anion, which would be I minus or Br minus or Cl minus or NO3 minus. The second type of strong electrolytes are the strong bases. And the strong bases are the alkali hydroxides of lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, and cesium, along with calcium, strontium, and barium of the alkali earth metals. You'll find these hydroxides 
in a B shaped on the your periodic table, but remember that these are positive two, so two hydroxides will go on them. These are positive one, so only one hydroxide will go on them. These are the strong bases, and they're a good source of OH minus ion, which is known as the hydroxide ion. The definition of a Bronsted-Lowry base is that it is a good H plus acceptor, and you'll see in all of these bases, when they ionize, they just need one H to form water, and so OH minus is a really good strong base, and these are good sources of that OH minus. Acids are proton H plus donors. Bases are proton or H plus acceptors. The last classification of strong electrolytes are the soluble ion containing, also known as ionic salts. And the soluble ionic salts that you need to know are simply four different things. These four things are anything that contains potassium, sodium, the polyatomic ion nitrate, or the polyatomic ion ammonium. Sodium and potassium are located in group one. Turns out lithium, rubidium, and cesium are also always soluble. Ammonium and nitrate are both polyatomic ions that you simply need to memorize. You need to know that those things always dissolve. They always dissolve to form ions and therefore must be written as positive or negative charged things. They're strong electrolytes because they're good conductors of electricity due to that positive and negativeness. Now, to know if it's a weak or non-electrolyte, it simply has to be not strong. So if it's not one of the things that I just mentioned over here, it's a weak or not. And for some people, that's a difficult classification. Once you classify something as a strong, weak, or non, you now can write it as its ions or in what's called its ionic equation form. Second thing that you need to know is the three basic types of reactions. Three basic types of reactions. And these are precipitation reactions, acid-base reactions, and oxidation reduction or redox reactions. And classifying what three types are completing those reactions is super duper important. A precipitation reaction is known as one that forms a solid, usually from two solutions or from ions that are dumped together. They form an insoluble substance, one that doesn't dissolve. Therefore, it's got to fit into this characteristic classification here that doesn't contain one of these ions because it's insoluble. If it has one of these, it will dissolve and has to be written as its ions. The second type, acid-base reactions, are where a proton, an H plus, is donated and an H plus is accepted. The proton is donated and the proton is accepted. An acid, remember, is a proton donor, and a base is a proton acceptor. For example, if we take water and react it with the cyanide ion, water will give away a hydrogen to the cyanide to make HCN and some OH minus. You'll notice that water gave away a hydrogen, so it's classified as the acid. Cyanide right here accepted a hydrogen, so it's classified as the base. You should be able to identify what happens from one side of the reaction to the other. The third type of reaction is known as a redox reaction. And this is where the charges, or ionic oxidation numbers, change from one side of the reaction called the reactants, to the other side. One classification of area that fits into redox reaction are combustion reactions. 
combustion reactions usually involve carbon and hydrogen containing things known as hydrocarbons. They're called hydrocarbons because they contain carbon and hydrogens. Here's an example called methane. When they react with oxygen, and they form carbon dioxide and water. You can assign oxidation numbers to substances according to a set of rules. Rule number one is if that something is in its elemental state alone by itself, like oxygen is right here, it has an oxidation number of zero. So this has an oxidation number of zero. Number two, oxygen is usually minus two and fluorine is always minus one. Now there is an exception for oxygen with hydrogen peroxide when it's minus one, but that's fairly rare. Number three, if it's from group one, it's positive one on the periodic table. If it's from group two, it's positive two on the periodic table. This is group one right here. This is group two right here. Rule number four is that the oxidation numbers have to add together, together to equal the charge on the species. And in here, C and H would have to add together to equal the charge that's written in the upper right hand corner. There's no number written here, so we assume it's zero. Up here in cyanide, carbon plus hydrogen would have to add together to equal negative one because there's a little negative one charge written up here. Rule number five, hydrogen is positive one with a nonmetal, and it's negative one when it's with a metal, but that's kind of rare. And then lastly, rule number six is a good, uh, good method to make an educated guess, an educated guess. And these aren't always true, but they're a good way to guess if you're not sure. You can usually say that group 17, when it's with a metal, is minus 1. That's this group right here, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. Fluorine's always minus 1, but these other ones, they can change. But a good guess is that they're minus 1, usually. This group right here, oxygen, of course, is almost always minus 2. And when in doubt, you can guess that these are minus 2, but sulfur breaks that rule a lot. This group, minus three for nitrogen, usually, but nitrogen breaks that rule quite a bit, especially in polyatomic ions. Same thing with phosphorus and arsenic. So you have to be kind of careful with that. Tin and lead, almost always plus two or plus four. Generally, you see them be plus two, and those are some good educated guesses. So going through and assigning oxidation numbers for this, you'll be able to see that this is a redox reaction. Oxygen, of course, is zero here. And over here on this side, oxygen's minus 2. Since it's minus 2 and there's two of them, carbon is going to have to sum together with that minus 4 species. So carbon's positive 4 over here. Oxygen's minus 2 right here. And each one of these hydrogens must be plus 1 then to balance it out. So it adds up to 0 because there's no number in the upper right-hand corner. So it must add up to 0. Hydrogen over here is with a non-metal, so hydrogen must be plus one. And if there's four plus ones, that means carbon must be minus four to balance out those plus ones, because it must add up to zero. So you can see from the left side of the reaction, oxygen went from zero to minus two, and carbon went from minus four to plus four. So the thing that went up in charge was minus four to plus four, and that is oxidized up and oxidized both start with a vowel. And the thing that went down in charge or was reduced, down and reduced both start with consonants, was oxygen. It went from zero to minus two. From zero to minus two is down in charge and therefore oxygen was reduced. Being able to assign oxidation numbers and determine whether something is oxidized or reduced is critical on this test. Lastly, I'll give a few notes on finding moles and molarity. And this is about aqueous solutions, so you have to be able to know how to find molarity, moles, and liters from the molarity triangle, knowing that molarity takes on units of moles 
per liter or moles times liters to the negative one and being able to solve for one of these. You can sometimes dilute solutions such as this using MIVI is equal to MFVF because the moles are equal on both sides. This is when you have a solution and you add water to it and dilute it. And then lastly, lastly, the um, steps in a solution stoichiometry problem that are similar to the ones we did in chapter three, where step number one is to write the balanced chemical equation frequently done for you. Step number two, convert to moles, usually using the molarity triangle, but sometimes also using the periodic table. And then step three, use the mole to mole ratio from the balanced chemical equation. And step number four, convert to the asked for units, which might be grams, and then you'd have to use the periodic table, or it might be the molarity triangle again, because they might want to know the liters, or they might want to know the moles, or they might want to know the molarity. Usually you're in moles already, and they want to know one of those other two. These notes need to be set on the side of what the rest that you write down, because I'll refer to them when we go through the problems, and you'll see that every one of these things are critical to understanding how to answer each one of the test questions. So pause the video now, and make sure that you get your test out in front of you, and you have another piece.